Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe to the RSS feed, and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. Here's your chance to catch up on all of those Creating Wealth shows that you've missed. There's a three-book set with shows 1 through 60, all digital download. You save $94 by buying this three-book set. Go ahead and get these advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. It's my pleasure to welcome Kyle McDonald to the show. He is the author of One Red Paperclip. And if you haven't heard the story, I'm amazed because this is quite an amazing story and it's very viral. Many, many people have heard about it. It's extraordinary in so many ways where Kyle started out and traded one red paperclip all the way up to getting a house out of all of these trades. So we're going to hear about that. And he's working on a new project now called Who Are These Guys, where you'll hear about how he's trying to find some people and just some really interesting stuff. Kyle, welcome to the show. How are you? Great. Yeah, glad to be here. Good, good. And you come to us from Toronto today or Montreal? Montreal. Montreal. Yeah. Great. Well, great to have you on the line. So first of all, did the one red paper clip idea just happen by accident or did you plan it or it's such a sort of an outlandish thing, really? How did it happen? I really planned to try it out to see if it would work. I was planning this idea in my head of walking around and trading with people for bigger and better things. Like when, when I was growing up, there was a game called Bigger and Better, you know, sort of a neighborhood game. You would start with a small object, go to a neighbor's door and say, hey, we've got this spoon. Do you have anything bigger or better you'd like to trade us? And then people would often, yeah, I've got this old rolling pin or I've got this boot or something. And you would come home after making a few trades with something a lot, a lot larger. And I always thought it'd be fun to play that game, um, not a, as a child who kind of gets bored of it after a few hours, but sort of professionally to see if you could really trade up something big. So I took the concept and uh, just put it on the internet. And I started with a red paperclip because that was the, the first thing I, I saw when I thought of actually putting it on the internet and uh, just asked if anyone wanted to trade something bigger or better than a paperclip. And a few days later, I made a trade for a pen shaped like a fish. <laughs> and where, where on the internet did you put it? Were you on eBay or where did you do it? You know what? I didn't, I didn't use eBay once. It was all, um, I had a sort of really rough blog website at the time. And I was just making little posts on different, in the barter section uh, on Craigslist in different cities. Was it a regular size paperclip? Just a little one for paper? Yeah, it was or was like it a, some like funny regular, novelty item? The size of paperclip you think of when you see, think of paperclips, the exact, like, exactly like that. And it happened to be red. Wow, amazing. Okay, so then it was the fish pen. And what happened after that? I posted the fish pin in the barter section of Craigslist. And, uh, you know, we were in Seattle that day and I, we went over to this woman's house and, and I traded the fish pin for a doorknob. Right after that, posted the doorknob and traded that for a camping stove and, and on and on. <laughs> what kind of house did you end up with? I ended up with like a two-story farm. Not a farm. I guess it'd be, you could call it a farmhouse. Um, it was right on... Main Street in Kipling, Saskatchewan, Canada, which is like a really small town in the Canadian Plains. And it was just, you know, it was this sort of magical little house in a way, because if you look at, you know, a child, you ask a child to draw you a house, they often draw like a, 
a square with a triangle roof and a door in the middle, and it was exactly like that. Right. I, I, I believe I've seen the photo of that house, too. I, I mean, how long did this all take, and how many trades were involved? And, and, you know, it sort of begs the question, Kyle, why would someone want to trade because it's the bigger and better concept? So why would someone give you something better for the seemingly lower end thing that you had to trade them. Well, it's it's the principle that things are worth different amounts to different people. Some people are not willing to spend more than $10 on a bottle of wine, while others will gladly spend hundreds. But really, the, the liquid inside is very, very similar. And yeah, you can argue with quality and all those type of things. But really, that the same principle was at work here. And it's always at work with any any situation in life, I think. There was people that said, yeah, I've got this object that I literally was going to throw away or give to a friend because I'm moving, depending on what time, the point in their life um, they were at. And I said, yeah, that's a lot bigger and better than the thing I have right now. I'll, I'll take that off your hands. And as it turns out, a lot of people um, have things or abilities that they're, they don't really use at all. And that there's good value in all of that stuff. So um, the items, the trade items themselves, were, were it's a very, very fluid value thing. It's not like everyone's going to actually take everything in their house and put it on eBay. It's been done a couple of times, but it's just not the reality. It's a lot of work to do something like that. And, and really, that's just a, a general market. Anything at all in life is only worth what someone else is willing to give you. And that doesn't mean money. That just means if someone says it makes you an offer, then you negotiate after that point. And how many trades were there to get from the paperclip to the house? 14 trades. That's it? That's yeah. amazing. Only 14 trades. You you got to tell us more of the trades because I am amazed that it went up that quickly. It kind of almost, Kyle, reminds me of that old funny mathematical equation that says if you double a penny every day for 30 days, you have over, I think, a million dollars, which is, is mind-blowing. But when you really sit down and do that, it's true. 14 trades, though, got you from what was the value of the house? Well, you know what? I don't know because I, I didn't purchase the house. I signed the deed. And then funny thing is when we moved to town, the, the house was, uh, there was over, well, let's see, there was 400 houses in town. And that by the, um, sorry, there were 400 houses in town and over 100 of them were for sale. After we'd been in Kipling for a year or two, they'd actually discovered oil nearby. So they, the, there was only two or three houses for sale after that two or three years. And at that stage, I decided to actually donate the house back to the town of Kipling because I wasn't interested in selling it. And I, I just wanted to make sure that the, um, the, the the community got this sort of like tourist attraction, community asset back because they were the ones who put it up in the first place. And to me, it was never about having the house. It was always about seeing if it could be done. Right, right. Which it's amazing that it could be done. I mean, but you must have had some ideas to the value for your own edification, right? Well, would you buy a house in Kipling, Saskatchewan? Uh, I don't know. I've been to Saskatchewan before, but I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it just it, it's interesting. So, fourteen trades. Can you tell us about any of the other trades? Yeah. The um. So I I guess where we left off, I had the uh, yeah, the doorknob, camping, right? The doorknob. And then camping I traded stove. for a yeah. camping stove. I actually traded the camping stove for uh, I call it an instant party, which was a, a beer keg and a neon Budweiser sign, and also a, a, an IOU to fill the keg with beer. So that was the instant party, and I swapped that for a, a snowmobile. Wow. What? And, and was it a working snowmobile? Yeah. I, actually, the guy I traded with in like, the Montreal area, he's quite a local celebrity, and he, he offered his worst snowmobile. So it was kind of funny, but as it turns out, it was not, not in too bad condition. And he had five or six snowmobiles, and this being the worst one kind of was fun. Fully functional snowmobile, though, is the sort of thing, though, but... There you go. There's the value. It was wintertime in Canada. A snowmobile is very valuable to a lot of people. But if you think about someone like, you know, in the tropics, the snowmobile is not going to really do anything for them. Yeah. So so certainly it's a it's a matter of people seeing different value in different things, just like you say. Okay, so now you're, you've got a snowmobile. And what trade number is that? Five, six? Yeah, six, five or six. So we're, we're almost halfway through. I traded the snowmobile. There's a, you know, a a snowmobile magazine out in Western Canada that said, hey, we'll trade you a trip for two to the Rockies if you want to trade us that snowmobile. So I said, yeah, absolutely. I didn't have a way to get the snowmobile to the Rockies to make that trade, though. And while I was thinking, I sort of tentatively agreed to make that trade. Um, this guy called me up and he says, my name's Bruno. I'm calling you from Cintas, which is a, a uniform company. They, they clean bathrooms and doormats and stuff like that. Yeah, we've purchased uh, logo wear from them. <laughs> yeah, no, they're great guys. And I, I actually had been wearing my cousin husband's shirt. A guy named Ricky used to work for Cintas. I've just been wearing his shirt just sort of as a bit of an inside joke through all of the trades. 
and I never, you know, asked Cintas for permission or anything like that. I just wore their shirt on the website and in pictures. So the general manager for the province of Quebec, you know, one of the largest provinces in Canada for this big, huge, multi-billion dollar company called me up and was like, well, what are you, what are you doing wearing our shirt? And what's this trading thing? And he wasn't angry at all. He was just sort of confused and excited almost. And I said, well, you know, it's inside joke. My cousin's husband, all this stuff. He, he loved it. We met up for dinner and he actually offered me an, like a box truck, a big cube van moving truck um, in exchange for that trip for two to the Rockies. You know, I had their logo on the side and it was an older one of their models. So they had to actually cycle it out of their inventory in the near future. So I wound up putting the snowmobile in the back of the truck, driving all the way out to the Rockies and Bruno, the gentleman from Cintas, actually flew there, met up with us, and we made two trades all at once. And I wound up leaving that deal with a uh, with the moving truck. <laughs> Amazing story! Wow. Okay, keep going. So I had this mu- moving truck, and I was like, I, it was really tough because it was huge. It was a giant vehicle, and I was like, I pretty much need to go straight to a house after this, or find something that's you know has a lot of value but is very small, something like you know a ring or uh, an opportunity, really. And I got an offer for. A, for the moving truck from this guy who um, worked at a recording studio. And he said, I can offer you enough studio time for you, for a band or a, an artist to record their entire album. What would you say? And I said, yes. And I drove all the way to this recording studio. We made the trade. And I, I walked away with that deal with this huge opportunity to record an album with all this promotional stuff attached to it. And But it was on a piece of paper. It was a promise. So I kind of wanted to, I wouldn't say trade it fast, but I wanted to make sure that I found someone who would put this to good use. So I ended up trading the recording contract with a woman named Jody Gannett from Phoenix. And Jody said, this would be perfect for me. I can definitely record my album. This is you know, a dream come true. I have one year of rent in my duplex house in Phoenix. I can offer that to you. And, uh, this, and this was pre-housing crash Phoenix. So it was you know, worth quite a bit. And I actually made the trade with Jody. Wound up down in Phoenix with this year of rent. And a very, Jody went up to record her album. And I kind of very quickly traded the year of rent with this woman named Leslie who worked at Alice Cooper's restaurant. And she, she offered me an afternoon with her boss. And I kind of thought it was the boss of her restaurant. But it turns out it was the owner of the restaurant who's Alice Cooper. And I got a, an afternoon with Alice Cooper for a year of rent uh, in a house. And it, a lot of people thought that was crazy. I thought it was great because you can't actually sign up to purchase an afternoon with Alice Cooper. It's one of those things that the value is either worthless or worth a lot to one, to one group of people. So I wound up in Fargo, North Dakota, on stage with Alice Cooper, doing like a little promo thing for this afternoon with him. Um, it was really fun. And I, you know, I was getting all these crazy offers from around the world for an afternoon with Alice Cooper. And, and people were offering some quite valuable things, but just, it just didn't feel right. And then I got a phone call, and this guy named Mark said, look, this would mean a lot to me if I could meet Alice Cooper, if I could go, go backstage, get some, get some pictures with him. Um, and actually take some pictures of him on stage and backstage because he, you know, I'm, my name is Mark and I'm from Kentucky and I'd like to be a concert photographer. That's my, my dream and my passion. And I said, that's perfect, Mark. I, I, I want to trade with you. This is, you're the guy to trade with. But this, you know, I'm trying to trade up. What have you got to trade? And Mark, what he did was um, he started listing all this rock memorabilia and it was all these things like yeah, a Kiss guitar and Peter Frampton's talk box and things like this. And then at one point he said, um, he had a Kiss snow globe. And I sort of had this light bulb go off in my head, but it wasn't like an incandescent light bulb. It was more like a compact fluorescent light bulb that was a bit tired and old and didn't fully illuminate. But after it fully illuminated, I said, did you just say you have a Kiss snow globe, Mark? And Mark said, uh, yeah, definitely. It's, like, it's the best snow globe I own. And he started laughing. And I said, well, would you be willing to trade that snow globe with me for the afternoon with Alice Cooper? And this is like, you know, a 35, literally a $35 snow globe that you can purchase on eBay. And Mark's like, are you crazy? I'm like, I might be, but I think this might, this might work well. And what I hadn't really thought of before was this, this guy had called me up named Corbin Burnson and he said, yeah, I'm this actor. LA and, law. Yeah. LA, yeah. LA law and major league and all these things. And I, I didn't really know who he was. So I went on the internet and he, he actually offered me a role paid speaking credited role in a Hollywood film. But, um, I didn't know who he was. So I went on Wikipedia to, you know, to check him out. And on, on the trivia section in Wikipedia, it says Corbin Burnson is one of the world has one of the world's largest snow globe collection, over seven thousand snow globes. And that little piece of information stuck in my head for some reason. So when Mark actually made the offer for the snow globe, I said, "Hey, Mark, hang on a sec. I'm going to call Corbin." So I called up Corbin and said, "Hey, would you like to trade that movie role for this Kiss snow globe?" 
And Corbin said, well, you know, what do you mean the kiss snow globe? So I sent him a picture. Corbin called me right back and said, not only do I want it, I need it. So I ended up trading this snow globe with, with uh, Mark and people on the internet freaked out. They thought I was totally blowing it and it was some publicity stunt. It was all a scam just for this snow globe or something like that. And then about a week later, I kind of let them have their fun and freak out. But then a week later, I said, all right, I've traded the snow globe with Corbin Burns in now for this movie role. And then people, oh, I see what you did there. And then um, I got tons of offers for the movie role because a lot of people want to be in you know, feature films. So I wound up with the movie role, traded with Corbin, took the snow globe down to LA, and uh, we made the trade. I, we checked out his snow globes. And then after that, um, walked outside and the phone rang, and it was this guy named Bert Roach. He's the economic development officer for the town of Kipling, Saskatchewan. And Bert said he had this crazy idea about trying to get town council to trade one of their houses for the movie role and all this stuff. And I said, okay, well, see what you can do, Bert. So he, he went in and he convinced town council that they owned a few houses around town to, uh, to make this trade. They, said, they came back and said, yeah, we're going to do this. And they threw in um, that they would build the world's largest red paper clip. They'd make uh, me mayor for the day, give me a key to the city. My girlfriend and I would be uh, lifelong citizens of Kip- Kipling, honorary. And they would throw Saskatchewan's biggest housewarming party ever. So I, I said, yes, absolutely. We went to Kipling. I made the trade for the movie role. And then the best part was during the house. Uh, so I wound up with the house like that. But the best part was during the housewarming party, uh, the town of Kipling kind of held open auditions for the movie role. So people from, from town and all over the world came to audition for this role in the movie. Corbin, Corbin was there, friends and family. And it was just this huge sort of celebration, uh, which was amazing because, you know, most of the people that traded came to town and uh, it was just sort of a great time because as the, the project had happened through the internet and I had made all of, all of the trades in person, this was a great time for everyone to get together and sort of experience it for real. So that was kind of the real high point was at the end, uh, the big party. That is just an amazing story. You know what it also shows? I mean, obviously, like you said, things, Kyle, have, have different value to different people. But in addition to that, it also sort of reminds me as the concept in economics about the specialization of labor and how there are different ways that you put people and things and, and material resources to work. And they add so much more value depending on how you use them these different pieces of the puzzle it seems like in the in the trade from the one red paper clip all the way up to the house you really kind of solved a lot of people's problems didn't you i wouldn't say i solved their problems what i did do is you made a few dreams come true though meeting alice cooper and i mean just sort of some different kind of stuff no I, what, what i did was i sort of just said i've got this now does anyone want to you know try and create something more on top of this and every time someone would step forward and i was getting you know sometimes hundreds of offers but I really chose to work with people that I wanted to, that I trusted, that I liked their kind of, you know, ideas and stuff. And then we created something much larger by working together and exchanging. Well, we exchanged all sorts of things, whether it was with Jody. I actually, she worked for an airline, so I got a few free flights out of the deal. And we, we sort of sort of played this whole game to see if what we could create in terms of value over the course of a year. But it was definitely, it was completely opportunistic and, and in the best sense of the word. Opportunistic is often associated, I think, with people being opportunistic about others. This was presenting something and then um, getting sort of a constant flow of pitches on ways to create more with that. Sure, sure. So it was a one-year project then? Yeah, you know, it went from the day. I was, it was going to be a year and five days, but I, I said, Bert, you're in a trade for this house. Let's, let's do it five days earlier so we can say we did it within a year. So they went, he went back to town council and got it done faster. So July 12th to July 12th. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Have there been any stories that you've heard about where you've inspired them to do something similar and, and they've followed on, on your coattails? Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a gentleman right now who started with a toy spaceship, and he's actually trying to trade up to a trip to space. 
Um, he's gotten quite far. I think he's at one of those zero gravity flights. And you know who really does well with this, though, are local radio stations that have a, a captive audience of listeners. And they'll just say, hey, we're going to start with this toothpick or with this pen. Does anyone have anything you know, bigger or better? So the phone will ring and they'll get emails and they'll go on air. And the, the audience is so large that they're, you know, there's advertising opportunities being taken up by a lot of people making these trades. And what they've done in within two or three weeks sometimes is trade up to a, a new car or something like that. And then they've auctioned it off for charity. So it's sort of like a fun game they have with their listeners, which is a really neat dynamic. Right, and it really is a very engaging game, too, because it's not just about winning a simple prize or, or something. There's a, a lot of sort of strategy and smarts that go into all this trading, right? For sure, and then people along the way that make the trades, they're not exactly donating something. They're saying, well, uh, we'll I'll give you this uh, expensive Native American carving for that trip for two to Hawaii, um, and Maybe they make these carvings and they get it. It's just, so there's actually good value exchange happening. The radio station raises the money for charity and everyone kind of who opts in wins in some ways. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a real win-win and, and something of bigger value is created out of it. Did Craigslist call you up and say, hey, will you be our spokesperson or something like that? I, I, you know, I've never received a call or any uh, comments from Craigslist. I'm a, I'm a massive fan of Craigslist. Curiously, I've actually wound up working on some sort of cross promotion stuff with Kijiji in Taiwan. So I was, you know, I went to Taiwan and spoke to people and they wanted to, I guess, get associated with the story. And I, I, I thought it was great. I was, it was a great trip. My wife and I went there and uh, met some really nice people and they were doing a, a similar project, starting with some small things and, and working up. So it was a, it was a really fun, fun uh, project we worked on together. Very cool. Well, hey, tell us, Kyle, what you're up to nowadays in looking for these five, five strange guys. What's that all about? This is sort of an inside joke that's getting a bit more turned outside, you could say. My, my brother was on the internet in 2002 and just found some funny picture, picture of five guys. And if you go to the website, whoarethesguys.com, you'll see the picture and he sent it to me. I started laughing, and I sent it to some friends. And it, it's been around our circle of friends. It was around our circle of friends for many years. Now, what happened was uh, when I did the red paperclip story, I, I had all this tons and tons of media attention. And when I was making the trades, I would always say, yeah, I've got this item right now. If anyone wants to trade, let's make a trade. So we traded to the house, moved into the house, and then the media kept calling, though. And they said, so what are you doing now? You traded a paperclip for a house. You must be doing so many other things. And um, at the time, I was writing a book and really – being quite a bit of a hermit, not doing much else. But I just went on TV and said, yeah, I'm looking for these five guys. Kind of as an inside joke, just to show my friends and buddies that I was on TV holding this picture up that we'd been laughing about for years. And they, their first reaction was, the media board is like, well, who are they? And we said, well, we don't know. We're looking for them. Where'd you get the picture? And I explained that my brother found it. And they started coming up with ideas and things like this. And it sort of spread a bit through the media that we were looking for these guys. Um, and then a few years later, I just I realized that Maybe I would try and track them down a bit bit further. So I've actually signed up for a show at the Fringe Festival in Montreal and Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, this summer. It's, the show is called Who Are These Guys? I'm going to walk out on stage with a picture of the guys and uh, show our attempts thus far to try and find them and then kind of open it up to the public to see if anyone else can help us uh, solve this important mystery. I'm looking at the video you have uh, of these Who Are These Guys on YouTube. You've got just under 1,200 views, which in your world isn't that many, but boy, when you look at the actual video, I, I see this on big screens at conventions and events and you know, news media on, on television where you're holding up the picture and so forth. Just interesting. I mean, what have some of these media outlets said to you about this project? I don't know. A lot of them sort of see it as tongue in cheek. They think I'm joking. They think I know who they are or they think this is just a, some sort of stunt. But I think it's an actual very interesting social experiment. We're taught that Google can solve everything. The Internet, it's, it's, everything's instant. You can communicate with anyone. You can learn anything quickly. But there's so many things that uh, maybe we don't need to know, but we just simply can't either. Knowing who these five guys are is very, very unimportant. It doesn't, it's not going to change any. Well, it might change some people's lives, but if I wanted to find out who they are, it's, I can't really do that that easy. And I think it's sort of always smart to challenge how good things are by saying, well, wait a second, we can't find who these guys are yet. And it's a really interesting um, process to actually ask people what their ideas are rather than them just go, oh, I'll find out the answer and take the, the internet, whatever they find on the internet, verbatim. I think it's more interesting sometimes to kind of 
to have an imagination about it rather than a, a solid answer. Yeah, it, it really is. And you can search words on the internet. Google Goggles project is, is pretty interesting about how you can photograph a place on your smartphone and then Google can find that place. I, I can't imagine that would be very accurate, but why can't you take an image and search for the image? Now, what you said to me before we started recording was interesting about how you've tainted the crime scene. Tell people what you mean by that, if you would. Absolutely. Um, I've posted this picture all over the internet. Countless other people have taken pictures on their phones and spread it everywhere. And the picture is so far flung on the internet now that if I do a, a Google image search, the only ones that turn up really, especially on the first five or ten pages, are ones that I've put out, out there or, or other people I know have. So the idea of having this pristine quick link to where the picture came from originally uh, with the description of maybe of who they are, but maybe it was just a picture that was found in a garbage bin one day and someone just sort of scanned it and posted it on the internet. We really don't know. It's, it's the same thing if, if you find a boot on the street. Whose boot was that? Why, did it, why is it there? You, often it's just a mystery. And I think the, the I, I like to call them important mysteries, tongue firmly in cheek on the important, obviously. But uh, I, I think these are important mysteries. And I think it's important to have mysteries because if we know everything, then we, st we lose our imagination. You know, sometimes when you're at a bar and you, oh, what's that guy's name from that movie? And you, you can instantly look on IMDb and figure it out. But it's kind of powerful, I think. We've, you know, humans have evolved having these these mysteries and curiosities. I think it's important to keep those, not to not progress, but I think it's important to sort of have that sense of wonder and excitement. It definitely is. Maybe this is one of the last frontiers for electronic stuff is to find out who are these guys. It's really interesting. What's next for you, Kyle? I mean, you got to find these guys. Uh, do you think you'll do it? I mean, how, how are the leads going? You know, are, uh, has, the, has the trail gone cold or, or is it reasonably warm or, or how is it going? The trail heats up and cools down from time to time. I've got a lot of crackpot ideas. A lot of people drift towards, they're the band from Southern California called the Do Run Runs, or they're Menudo, or they're these very, you know, I'm not going to say typical answers, but, I've, you know, I've literally never followed up with any of those bands or interviewed them. So maybe I will, uh, maybe I'll follow up with some bands and see if, if it in, is in fact them. I need to get a positive or a negative identity on at least one of these guys and ask him what's with the picture, what was happening then. And then I'd like to kind of show that person the, the entire backstory of how we found him. I think that'd be an interesting experience for someone. Oh, yeah, I think they'd be fascinated by it. <laughs> and you're probably going to make them quite famous. I mean, if there's some band who was in the garage before and never got anywhere, <laughs> you know, they'll probably get some airplay out of, uh, out of your big search for them. But very interesting. So what's next for you? I know you're working on finding the guys. What else are you up to? You know, I, I, when I was growing up in high school, my two least least favorite things were writing book reports and public speaking. I was always loved sports. I loved math. I, I liked writing, but not writing about other people's stuff. And, you know, I wound up writing a book and I've turned into, I wouldn't say I've turned into a public speaker, but I've spoken quite a few times. And I really like uh, sharing stories, telling stories um, in a live arena. So I think more speaking and, um, and more writing, definitely going to write some more stories and some more books. Fantastic. Well, Kyle, tell people where they can learn more and where they can get the book. The book is called One Red Paperclip. If you go to Amazon and you uh, search for Red Paperclip, if you use the term Red Paperclip anywhere on the internet, that's me. And you can find my contact info in the book very, very easily. Good stuff. Well, Kyle McDonald, thank you so much for telling us about your adventures today. Very, very interesting. And keep it up. I hope you find those guys, okay? I sure hope so, too. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 
and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.